In January 2023, I traveled to Bioko Island in Equatorial Guinea, primarily to find drills, a very rarely observed large primate. It is notoriously difficult to get a visa for Equatorial Guinea, and I was not surprised for the connecting flight to be nearly empty. The capital Malabo is quite modern, and as usual there were churches throughout the country in good condition but otherwise things look very different. Thanks to large oil reserves, Equatorial Guinea is ranked as continental Africa's most wealthy country, yet the UN's Human Development Index assigns it a global rank in the bottom quarter. Much of its oil income has only benefited the president's family, and in terms of political liberty, it is ranked as one of the five worst countries in the world. As a tourist, you need a permit for any and all locations you visit, and you have to be really cautious with photography. together with a group of very experienced mammal enthusiasts. Our first stop was Pico Basil National Park, close to the capital. We hiked up to what locally, in Africa's only Spanish-speaking country, is known as the Caldera de Monos, the Caldera of Monkeys. We found red-eared guenons, but only in the far distance. <laughs> The main destination of the trip was the Gran Caldera de Luba scientific reserve. From the harbor in Luba we took a basic boat for a couple of hours and landed on a remote black sand beach in the very south of the island. I was excited to be here, supposedly the only spot on earth where you have a reasonable chance to see drills. set up camp in a small clearing next to the beach. The weather was mostly just sunny, humid and hot, but the waterproofing on my tent was soon tested as we were in the rain forest. This was certainly not a relaxing beach vacation, and if it were, I would not have been there. A typical day in the forest meant getting up very early after a sweaty night for a quick breakfast in order to start the search for wildlife before sunrise. was in very good condition, but the sad signs of so-called civilization soon became obvious. The beach and coastal forest were completely littered with plastic garbage washed ashore by the ocean, mostly from faraway places as indicated by the labels. And sadly, there were many signs of hunting activity, such as cartridges and shells of recently butchered sea turtles. These were the shells of green sea turtles, which I had some fantastic encounters with just a few months earlier while diving in Indonesia. It was the nesting season and I hoped to see them coming ashore at night, right here. The turtles lay their eggs at exactly the same beach where they hatched many years earlier. During the day we could see turtle tracks all over. To observe them after dark, one has to be extremely quiet and only use red light. spent two incredible nights admiring the effort to build a nest in the sand, 
followed by what is called the turtle trance, when the laying of eggs starts. my heart imagining a green sea turtle coming up from the ocean, maybe 40 years after her birth, just to be cut open for human consumption. sleep is completely overrated, I also looked for nocturnal animals in the forest. Following others with much better night vision and the advantage of thermal scopes, I was able to observe a western tree hyrax, a small mammal that has a call of an incredible 160 decibels, and animal ewers which are squirrel-like rodents with membranes between their legs, allowing them to glide graciously from tree to tree. were much less abundant than I had expected, but likely this had mostly to do with my focus, since primates, in particular drills, were always the main target. A promising sign were a few aggregations of butterflies. They are attracted by pea, which contains salt. Maybe a drill had relieved itself here? The first primate I saw were crowned guenons, a small monkey common throughout western Central Africa. By taking a lot of time, much of it standing in large mud pools, I finally managed to get much closer to radiate guenons, which I had earlier seen at Pico Basile. They were very wary of my presence, permanently calling out to warn the other group members. special encounter was with Pennant's red colobus. The Bioko subspecies can only be found in this location and is critically endangered. The population is thought to have dropped by 80% just in the last 20 years. The drills proved to be much more elusive. They were coming right up to the beach to dig up turtle eggs but were smart enough not to be seen. The eco-guards describe this as a very recent behavioral change possibly because certain trees are no longer fruiting reliably due to climate change, forcing drills to look for alternative food sources. While waiting next to the beach, myself and others caught some very short glimpses of drills, but only when I followed the guides into the forest, I had a wonderful sighting of a large multi-male, multi-female group crossing a river. After a few days of camping in the forest, we trekked out to the nearest road. We had to time our hike with the tides and started at night, first walking along the beach and then continuing in the forest. Our final 
final day outside of Malabo was spent on the northeastern side of Luba Reserve, very close to Mocha village, just as a reminder how messed up the situation is in Equatorial Guinea, we saw soldiers heading out for a hunting trip and, unsurprisingly, did see virtually no mammals and only a few birds. excellent sightings of the North Angalago and crested chameleons. I will certainly remember Bioko Island. It was sad to see numerous species being on the very verge of extinction due to hunting pressure in a country that could afford much better. And at the same time it was wonderful to spend extended time with green sea turtles at night and a short but fascinating minute with a big group of drills. 